All right. I think we are live. We should be. Anyways. Yes, connected. All right. So, uh, some. It's not necessary necessarily ecology in the news, but kind of is, maybe. We're talking about principle of allocation, right? Limited amounts of energy available to us. You know, we get it, then we have to allocate it in some way. This popped up. Don't know if you like peanut butter cups, but that's a big peanut butter cup. Big peanut butter cup. Anyways. No, the other one was was this. So we do, gosh darn it, parasites. Man hospitalized with mysterious Caesar, seizures was diagnosed with tapeworms that had been living in his brain for decades. Who can offer a suggestion as to what tapeworm this is? Oh. <laughs> There's a couple people in here. <laughs> Anybody has a rostellum? Actually, you probably looked at this in zoology. You looked at this tapeworm. No, hookworms are roundworms. That's nematode. Good guess. I mean, it looks like it. This is a rostellum with attachment hooks. Roll down, you see. Let's see if they've got a different picture. Nope, they don't. But that's better. Ha. There they are. Right here. The larval stages of uh, Tinea. Uh, you get it by eating the eggs, accidentally consuming the eggs of the tapeworm. Uh, and then we become an intermediate host. Basically a dead end for this parasite because we have to be eaten by another host, uh, which you know, unlikely will have unlikely to occur, but we do have the possibility of getting this. And this is uh, cystocercosis. It's in there, develops in the brain. It has severe cases, I mean, this is pretty severe. You have seizures, but oftentimes uh, you get seizures, you get headaches, and then you go into coma and, and likely die from the, the buildup of pressure. But this popped up in the news. I, I, tell, I told you guys, um, at least I tell the parasitology class where we do these on a regular basis, stories get recycled. This isn't the first time this, a story like this has, has popped up in the news. We usually see it one or uh, at least two times a year. All right, this time happens during the ecology class. So if you want to learn more about parasites, sign up for parasitology. Oh, no, you can't because it's full. It's full. Get on the wait list. It's full. Actually, no, we do. Uh, we have graduate, a couple graduate slots reserved. Uh, and come the spring, like the week before class is open, we don't have graduate students enroll. I open it up to, to undergrads. We just, we don't have time to teach a second lab for that class. All right. This is where we left off. Talking about reproductive strategies. But before we do that, reminder, exam. Exam on Friday. Uh, I'll try to get here at 10 till so we can start. All right, format the same. Uh, multiple answers. Uh, I did, I did adjust. I looked at counts of those questions that are like single answer questions. Uh, where it's all or none, so you don't have to choose, well, maybe there's two, maybe there's three, it's just one. Um, so I've adjusted that, so we've got 25 multiple answer, 20 of these uh, single answer questions. See if that kind of balances out a little bit better um, for the exam. Then we have calculations and definitions. So the calculations are our population growth, yeah, uh, growth equation, so uh, exponential growth, logistic growth, discrete growth, that sort of thing. Be ready for it. Uh, will we get the exams back the week 
of Thanksgiving? No, because we only have Monday, and then and we don't have class on Wednesday. So target date is to get it back on that Monday when we come back after Thanksgiving, so you have it. All right, looking forward, we have our final exam on Monday, 8 a.m. of exam week. Uh, the exam will be the same type of format. It'll be just be a little bit longer. It is comprehensive, uh, covers everything uh, that, that we've, we've done in this class. And uh, I do believe that we will likely finish um, the material on that Monday or, or Wednesday of that week. Yep. Yep, yep. What you get on final could replace your lowest exam grade. Uh, and I don't look at any of the extra credit. So if your lowest test grade, let's say, was, uh, we'll, we'll make it easy, out of, out of 100. So if your lowest test grade was, eight, was uh, at 70, and then you get your attendance extra credit, making it a 75, and then on, on another test you had, let's say, a 75, and you didn't get any extra credit, I replace that 70. And then the extra credit gets added on top of that, the grade they got replaced. So you don't lose it. You already have it. All right. So attendance. Uh, we have one more attendance quiz today. Uh, and then I will uh, put up and tally up what you would get on the third exam. And I'll have a column in uh, Blackboard where you can see and you can, you can assess it. You can already see the attendance quizzes for this set of the exams, for exam three. Uh, just, double, just double check that. Um, do you have the formulas? I give you the formulas. Formulas are on the exam. You need to recognize them and know how to use them. Bring a calculator. We're coming down to the wire, so. All right, so this is where we left off. Reproductive strategies, it's all about trade-offs. We still follow that VX curve, the reproductive value curve. So whatever strategy we pick, evolution is picking that strategy that has the most area under the VX curve. So we talked about the parental investments, and this includes both parental care and the allocation right to our offspring. So should we make big offspring, but fewer of them, or should we make small offspring, but a lot of them. We also talked about number of reproductive events. So should we reproduce multiple times over our life, or should we reproduce one time and expend all of our energy on, on that one output? Now, the parental investments are tied to survival of our offspring because our overall fitness is tied to their survival, and their prospects for reproducing. So if we can do what we can to encourage the, the offspring get to reproductive maturity and mate and have offspring themselves, then it's good for us. It's good for our fitness. The number of reproductive events, though, kind of balances our prospects of survival to the next reproductive period against reproducing now. So when we look at should we hold off and, and reproduce you know, a second time? Well, that might be a good thing to do if we know that, we're, that we have a very high likelihood of making it to next year. Then we can kind of withhold some of our energy. You know, instead of allocating it all to that one reproductive event, we can withhold some of it, keep towards maintenance and survival, and then have a second shot at doing this. When we switch to this iteroparous type of reproduction, what we could be doing is, is balancing the risks of total reproductive failure across several years. So with semiparous reproduction, if we reproduce in a bad year, good chance that we could lose all of them. But because we produce so many offspring, we're trying to increase the chance that at least one or two or three of them survive. Iteroparous, if we, if we reproduce in a bad year, we lose all that offspring, but that, but that tends to be offset uh, by reproducing again later in life. So age at reproductive maturity kind of follows along the same lines. You know, what's our prospect of surviving in the future? And what's our prospect of reproducing in the future? 
All right, so with this age of reproductive maturity, it comes down to a question of when should we begin reproducing? Should we begin now or should we hold off and wait until we're older? So we've got this, th these two strategies, reproduce early in life or delay your reproduction. And we'll talk about both of these. So when should, when should early maturation be favored? Early maturation should be favored when our chance of surviving, uh, I should say, uh, should be favored under a couple different situations, circumstances. One of them is when our chance of surviving each year keeps going down. So we don't want to hold off. Like if we have a chance of surviving is 90% this year, and then 70% next year, and 50% the year after that, and then 20% the year after that, you can see that with each year that we survive, we're making it less and less likely that we'll survive again. So if we hold off until year three or year four, we might never reproduce. So this is a situation now where selection would favor those individuals that reproduce early and have their offspring before the chance of dying becomes so great that we lose the, the, the chance of have it, having kids, having offspring. So when we invest in early mature, or when we choose this path of early maturation, what we're going to do is invest in reproduction instead of growth. Because if we didn't, if we decided to hold off, well, now we have that energy that used to be go towards this reproduction can now be used for growth. So if we do early maturation, yeah, it's a good chance that we survive to reproduction. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And especially if, our, if we're not expected to live for very long, yeah, we should just kind of get out there, mature as early as possible, and start having, having offspring. This applies if we're a semel parous organism. If we're going to reproduce one time, get to reproductive maturity, reproduce because you might not reproduce again. But that doesn't necessarily apply to iteroparous reproduction. Because with iteroparous reproduction, we figure to reproduce two or more times across our life. So the benefit of reproducing early for these types of organisms is that we're giving ourselves a chance to reproduce more times in our life lifespan. So you can kind of make up this comparison if we have a lifespan of 10 years and we hold off and reproduce when we turn six. So we have six, seven, eight, nine, and maybe 10. So we've got five years of reproducing. If we hurry up and mature when we're three, We've just added a couple more years where we could reproduce and potentially get offspring into uh, that next generation. If we're going to delay our reproduction, then what we're going to do is invest in growth and maintenance early in life. And that could be benefit. That could be a benefit because by investing in growth and maintenance, we, we're going to be bigger, we're probably going to be more mature, more experienced by the time we reach, we reach reproductive maturity. That could be good if our reproductive output is correlated with our size. So a lot of organisms, the uh, bigger you are, the more offspring you have. So if more offspring we have, it increases our fitness, and we can have more offspring when we are bigger in size, then one of the strategies that might be favored is to delay our reproduction until we're older. And by delaying it, we're taking that energy that would have been used for reproduction and investing it in growth. The same applies if, if our mating success, our chance of finding a mate and actually reproducing, is tied to size or age, or maybe experience. In that case, 
Now, it benefits us to be bigger by the time we reach reproductive maturity. So to accomplish this, you invest your energy into growth early in life to get bigger so when you do reach reproductive maturity, you can have an edge over your competitors. All right, got it? All right, put it together. None of these strategies that we talked about, parental investment, age of maturity, uh, or uh, number of reproductive events, they're not mutually exclusive. We can't look at anyone in isolation without also considering the other two, and everything else that goes into those. Because it's selection is picking the overall strategy. That's why we call it a life history, uh, life history traits. It's a suite of all of these, these traits, or life history strategy. It's a suite of all of the traits. So what we end up seeing is that our strategy tends to be correlated to our survivorship or our uh, mortality risk in life. And our survivorship is often tied to where we are on our population size growth curves. So if, we are, if our population exists near its carrying capacity, then we're going to have a different set of traits and characteristics compared to those populations that are existing far away from their carrying capacity. And these two strategies represent extremes on a continuum. And we refer to them as either R selection strategies or K selection strategies. And they are named for this logistic growth curve. So R selection strategies are strategies that really aim at maximizing R. What's R? What is little r? Intrinsic rate of growth. It's, birth, it's, it's, our, it's our birth rates or death rates, migration rates. So all of our traits are kind of aimed at maximizing reproductive outputs. And the opposite end are these K-selection strategies named for K, which is what? Our carrying capacity, that's what it says. So we're going to be producing not necessarily quantity, but rather quality. We want to invest in a strategy that is going to be competitive because we are right near that carrying capacity, and when we're at the carrying capacity, we have the highest amount of intraspecific competition that there is excluding when we go above, and then it's even higher, but you get the idea. So we're going for more quantity, reproductive output for R. We're going for quality when dealing with these K selection strategies. All right. So our R selection strategies, we'll start first. Our focus is on current reproduction. It's on current reproduction. It's on that BX, that birth schedule, because we're usually at low densities. We're going to be far away from our carrying capacity. And this is low densities relative to the carrying capacity. And as I said, we're emphasizing the quantity of offspring. So what types of things, what, of, of the traits that we talked about, these trade-offs that we talked about, what are the traits that are usually associated with and our selection strategy. Simple parity. That's one. We're going to reproduce one time, and we are going to invest all of that energy into reproducing to try to maximize the number of offspring that we have. So we have large clutches, which is how many offspring we have in a reproduction, reproductive event. If we're going to have this massive clutch size, well, we're going to have 
small offspring. You can't have huge clutches with massive offspring. Just not possible. We typically see rapid growth, rapid growth early in life so that we can get to our reproductive age and consequently then we're going to age earlier in life or we're going to reach that reproductive maturity earlier in life. So again, we're trying to grow quickly, reach reproductive mature, maturity earlier so that we can have all of our offspring all at once with the hopes of getting all of our offspring out there before any of our competitors do, our intrust-specific competitors. And if we're doing all of this, we're producing you know, thousands of offspring, there's no way that we can care for all of them. So these organisms exhibit minimal, if any, parental care. Doesn't mean they don't offer some. Some species, they don't. They have their eggs, they vanish. Parents vanish. Others, they take care of the eggs maybe for, for weeks, in a few weeks, maybe they wait until they hatch, they still care for them a little bit, and then that's it. So, again, these are two extremes, R selection and K selection. These individuals that are R selection strategies typically exhibit a type 3 survivorship curve. So type 3 survivorship curves have high mortality early in life. The chance of making it to maturity is going to be pretty slim. That's why we have, that's why this works with having a large number of offspring. At least some of them will make it. It's also characteristic of low competition habitats. No big surprise, we're far from our carrying capacity. So at this point, we're seeing, or the organism is seeing basically unlimited resources. They can take the resources and invest in a huge, in having a large number of offspring. But this is also characteristic, or can be characteristic, of habitats that have frequent and harsh disturbances. So these are disturbances that basically act as like resetting our community. Our community progresses and starts to mature, and then it resets. So it's constantly like wiping out populations, constantly getting us back to this situation where we're far from our carrying capacity, our species sees uh, nearly unlimited resources, and thus can invest in having a whole lot of offspring to try to get more of our genes out there, more of our genetic code out there. That's our R selection strategy and the characteristics. We, we ready for the K, K selection? All right, K selection is typically near our carrying capacity. big part of our, our strategy involves planning for reproduction in the future. And when we're going to do this, we're going to try to focus on the quality of our offspring. Because we're holding off reproducing. If we're going to reproduce later in life, we want to do what we can to try to ensure that our offspring will survive and be competitive in this highly competitive environment because we are near our carrying capacity. So what are the traits that are associated with it? Well, they're basically complete opposite of the R selection strategy. So I said they're at two extremes of our continuum. So we're gonna have, we're gonna, these organisms tend to be iteroparous. Might reproduce two, three, four times, but at each reproductive event, we're having relatively small clutch sizes. You're having one or two offspring. Because you're doing one or two offspring, you can invest that energy into making them bigger. And being larger offspring gives them a competitive edge. If we're gonna invest in making these larger offspring, well, we're probably going to also invest in parental care and invest significantly in parental care because we've already invested a certain amount of energy in the offspring. It would be a shame if we lost that energy right after they were born. So 
We're investing additional energy to help ensure their survival. And with these organisms, they tend to exhibit slower growth because your survival chances are, are much, much higher. And with the slower growth, we delay our maturation until we're older, until we're bigger. We're later in life. We're more experienced. We've learned how to compete, how to get our, our limited resources. We're doing what we can to maximize the competitive ability of our offspring. Species with these, this type of strategy usually exhibits a type 1 survivorship curve. The survivorship curves have high survivorship early in life, and then it drops off as we reach our, our lifespan. They're usually in highly competitive habitats. Habitats that are near their carrying capacity. That's why it was named K selection strategies. And if these populations are going to be near our carrying capacity, well, if they're going to probably be from habitats that don't really have frequent disturbances. So infrequent disturbances. If they do have disturbances, they're probably going to be less severe. They're not going to be disturbances that completely reset a community. You may reset portions of it, but you don't reset the entire community. So in many cases, we refer to these habitats as being stable. If you look at them, they they relatively stable type habitats. Good. All right, so these are two opposite extremes. And hopefully you're kind of going, running through your head and saying, well, hold on, how do I place this species? And where do I place this, this species? And it's not always clear cut because these are just two ends of a continuum. What selection has done is taken aspects of both of these two extremes and tried to merge them. So you take some aspects of, let's say, our selection strategies and utilize them in a case selection strategy. So we're not completely at the two ends, but we're someplace in the middle. We may be, may be more R, we may be more K, or we could be kind of smack dab right in the middle. We, we refer to these organisms or these species that choose a strategy like this as bet hedging or hedging their bets. Right. So this idea uh, referred to bet hedging theory is, is saying that organisms that can experience unpredictable environments want to reduce the variation in fitness by spreading out their risk of reproductive, reproductive failure. So we're recognizing that every year is going to be different. I mean, that's part contingency in ecology. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. And same thing with the organisms. It's hard to predict what the environment's going to be like. So what they can do is balance some of this unpredictability. And by taking on a strategy that kind of holds their fitness at about the same place, regardless of what the environment's going to be like. Because again, fitness is a property of the environment. If the environment changes, so does our fitness. We don't want to have a high fitness one year and then have a fitness of zero because we can't successfully reproduce. So we have this bet hedging theory that, that, that is going to happen. And we're hedging our bets to avoid complete reproductive failure. So here, is a graph that kind of tries, tries to explain this process. All right. So we have mean reproductive success, which is average chance that we're going to succeed in reproducing when we do try. And it's plotted against unpredictability. So unpredictability in our environment 
It's really the idea of how favorable is our environment when we reproduce. It can either be very favorable and pretty much be favorable all the time, or it could be favorable, but it's highly unpredictable. So some years are good, some years are bad, and we can't we can't tell. Reverse. High predictability is up here. All right, unpredictability is up here. Predictability is down here. So if our predictability is very high, if we're going to have good year after good year after good year all the time, then if we compare Big Bang reproduction, so semi parity versus Iteral parity. Big Bang reproduction is going to be favorable. You can reproduce today because you know that your offspring are going to be born in a favorable environment. It doesn't benefit you to hold off and wait because the environment's not changing. It's going to be good for us. But as we start adding variation in our, in our predictability, now we start to switch to bet hedging. And you could say, well, why do we switch? What's going on? Well, if this line, this line down here is higher than our iteral parity, which means every point along this graph has a higher mean reproductive success. Mean reproductive success is tied to fitness. So if we com competed or uh, put two populations one semi parity, one arrow parity up against each other in this type of habitat here, Big Bang re reproduction is going to win out. That has a higher fitness, it's going to eliminate this population. But which one's favor changes once we start adding more and more and more unpredictability. Mean reproductive success, overall reproductive success is lower than it is up here. But we're not competing with this. We're competing vertically. So now when you have unpredictability in the favorable, con favorable conditions, iteral parity wins out because we can reproduce today and have offspring. But if the environment's bad, we lose them. That seems like a loss, but we're going to survive to tomorrow and have another chance at reproducing. Compared to semi parity, if we reproduce today and the environment's bad, we lose all of our offspring. That's it. We had our one shot, and that, that's done. So you have organisms that aren't necessarily truly semi parous, or organisms that are truly iteroparous, and you can say, why? Why is that? Why do some organisms only reproduce twice in their lifetime? Why do some organisms reproduce five or six times in their lifespan? Well, a big part of that is tied to unpredictability. The more unpredictable your environment is, the more we start to favor having more than one reproductive event in an attempt to avoid complete reproductive failure. And this also applies to clutch sizes. We talked about large clutch sizes. We can have a thousand offspring as a fish. Or you have one offspring as a human, one offspring on average as a human. But then we have everything in between. We have rodents that have, you know, seven to 12 offspring. We have birds that have maybe two or three or four or five eggs. Why? It's balancing. It's a balancing act. We are hedging our bets to try to ensure or give us highest average fitness. So when we do this, we will sacrifice some output. But it's aimed at avoiding a complete and total loss. All right. So example one. We can reproduce once and have 10 offspring. Or we have strategy two, where we can reproduce twice and have five offspring each time. Which one's favorite? It depends on our it depends on our environment and the predictability of the environment. In both strategies, we have a total of ten offspring. We have a total of ten offspring.
under strategy one, if we produce, have all 10 off, offspring at once and we, it just happens to be a bad year and they die, we lose. None of our genes get into that next generation. But if times are good, possibly all 10 get into that next generation. And not only that, but they can start reproducing that next year. The 10 copies can produce another 10 copies. Uh, we can produce another 10 copies. Pretty good expansion of our genome, of our, of our uh, genes. But in strategy two, we're only going to have five offspring this year. If it's bad, we lose all five offspring. But that's okay because we have a second shot next year when we're hoping that conditions improve. So it's unlikely, I mean, in order for us to have to lose all 10 offspring, we have to have two bad years. They have to be back-to-back -back bad years. So the chance that this happens is going to be pretty low. So we're less likely to lose all 10 offspring. But if we're in a good year, we're only producing five offspring compared to strategy use one, which was producing 10 offspring. So in good years, if we always have good years, strategy one is going to be favorable. But as soon as we start adding unpredictability and having good years and bad years and mixing it up when they occur, now you're going to start to see a transition towards strategy two because it avoids complete reproductive failure. This line, this point here where the lines cross represents the point where either strategy can work, and they are just as good. They're just as good as, you know, one is just as good as the other. And then which one wins out just kind of depends on randomness. Just as an FYI, uh, somebody has looked at plants. So we've got annual plants, uh, and a researcher was investigating this idea. When, should, when does it benefit us to reproduce a second time? And reproducing a second time that next year, he estimates that's equivalent to producing one more offspring for an annual plant. So we're not talking about massive differences in fitness. We're not talking about one massively greater than the other. It's these small edges that selection is going to favor, and that's what we see when we look at strategies today. Desert annuals, desert plants, also have a bet hedging strategy. And it's kind of with the grass seeds that we had. I don't know what was Monday. Who's in Monday's lab? What was your germination success for the control? What was the class average? Did you have that? 60%? 80%? Okay, cool. So desert annuals tend to be long-lived. Or, or the, their seeds tend to be long-lived. Desert annuals live a year, right? Uh, their seeds tend to be long-lived. All right, you go out there, you can find them. You have to look for them, but you can find them. But all of the seeds don't germinate at once. And we see this kind of across the board. You try to germinate some seeds, it's pretty unusual to get 100%. And the question is, why? Well, you could say, well, those, the seeds that didn't germinate are bad. right? They weren't going to make it to begin with, and that could be true. But with some plants, that's not the case. Those seeds are 100% viable. We try to germinate them this time. It didn't work. Then we try again a little bit later, and now at that time, they germinate. Why is that? Well, it's this bet hedging theory. These desert annuals only live a year. That's it. 
and their reproductive success is somewhat dependent on their, the conditions in which they live. So if they reproduce, set seed, and then their seed, all of their seeds germinate in a year that isn't very good for them, they lose. But these plants don't have the opportunity then of trying again because they, they, they had their one shot. They're annuals. They germinate, they grow, they flower, set seed, they die. Right? So how do they get, how do they get around this? They get around it by having only a portion of their seeds germinate at any one time. So if we start to increase the uncertainty in our good years, to start to make it more and more random, what we end up seeing is the proportion of seeds that actually germinate when we try to germinate them keeps going down to the point where maybe only 20% of the seeds will germinate this year. And then next year, another 20% will germinate. And maybe seven, eight, nine years down the line, now we get the last of the seeds germinate. Why is that? Well, the plant basically hedged its own bets. It didn't invest in seeds that germinated very next year because that next year could be very unfavorable for it. So what it does is it has a mechanism where not all the seeds germinate. So if it's bad next year, who cares? We still have future years where some of our seeds will, will germinate, grow, and hopefully flower and set seeds. Did this apply to our grass seeds? Probably not. Probably not. But does our annuals do this? Throw in a little botany for you. All right. Summary for this. Optimal reproductive output is not necessarily the physiological maximum. So we have a maximum. We can have maximum number of offspring. Every species can have a maximum number of offsprings, but we don't typically see that. The optimum output is usually less because we're balancing reproduction with survival. All right. So as part of this, we talked about the allocation of energy. Energy that's available to one is a, to one path is unavailable to the rest. So the organism had the choice, how does it best allocate the energy? Growth, reproduction, or maintenance. And then once we allocate it to one of those, we can further subdivide it to various processes. For reproduction, which is what we focused on, we talked about allocating it to size of the offspring, number of the offspring, parental care, uh, withholding some so that we can reproduce again later in life. Uh, and then also reproductive maturity. When do, we, when do we reproduce? When do we mature? All right. These strategies have a, a lot to do with our reproduction and our survival. So if we increase our reproductive output, we tend to decrease survivorship. If we increase survivorship, we decrease our birth schedule. And we said that the reason this is is because reproduction takes energy away from our growth and maintenance. And also with reproduction, we're exposing ourselves more. We are exposing ourselves to predators, to the environment, and so forth. We talked about all those different options. All right, we set them up as two extremes so that we can talk about these two ends of the continuum, the R selection strategies and the K selection strategies. You should know those. You should know the traits of those, those types of strategies. But these are two ends of the continuum. What we usually see is organisms are someplace in between because what they've done is hedge their bets against complete and total reproductive failure. So we usually see aspects of both of these R and K selection strategies see aspects of both in uh, the life history traits or the, the life history strategies of species that we're studying. All right, questions? Yes, no? All right, uh, I'm going to make the quiz go live. I know we have the exam on Friday. Uh, I'm going to make this quiz due on uh, Monday after Thanksgiving. And we have one more quiz after that.
because we're, on Monday we'll talk about competition communities and we should finish that up that following Monday. Probably two lectures left. All right, quiz. Two answers today. Uh, the answers are max dn over dt. So terms from like from a logistic growth curve. So max dn over dt. That's one answer. Then our second answer is k over two. don't know those terms, if you don't recognize them, I strongly suggest hitting the books and studying for this exam. Max dn over dt and k over 2. Those are our two answers. All right. The quiz keys should all be available. Can't access them, try on a desktop computer or a laptop. Go to grades, click on a quiz, click on the score. It should, it'll open it right up. All right, see you Friday.